been a long week for me. I haven't been here all week, but it's been a long week for me. I went to D.C. early in the week. That's about a three three hour and 45 minute uh, drive from where I live. And um, we got up there on Saturday afternoon and decided that we would just walk about and see all that we could see. My wife, my daughter, she's 13. And we saw quite a bit, a lot of walking. I don't know how many miles we walked, but it was, I would say several miles. And uh, finally on the last day, um, it was getting close to dinner time and my wife likes the cooking channel and she uh, likes Guy Fieri. I don't know if I said his last name correctly or not, but she likes him. And there is a restaurant there that he owns and uh, she really wanted to go. I said, well, let's go. It's only X number of miles from the Jefferson Memorial. Uh, it was quite a hike. And so uh, we decided that we would get a lift to take us up there. Why did you wait all these days to finally get a lift driver when we could have done that from the beginning? Well, I just like to walk, so that's what we did. I'm reminded of the story about the lady that was really interested in marriage. And I mean, so interested that she just started dating all of these guys, but she had a rule about it. And the rule was that she would never marry anybody unless that fella had at least $10,000 in the bank. That was just her rule, had to be $10,000. Now, obviously, this is an old story. It may be more than that now. <laughs> but anyway, that was her rule. And uh, she would start to get serious about a fella, and, and um, she would ask the question, uh, do you have $10,000 in the bank? And uh, he would say no and probably never will, and they would part company, and she would start dating somebody else. And then... She starts dating this guy that she really likes, and she's convinced he is the one. And uh, so she, she told him, here's the rule. You gotta have at least $10,000 in the bank. Do you have it? He said, no, but I'm willing to work on it. And she said, that'll be fine. You just, you work on it, we'll date. So they dated for, for a while, and I mean, she just decided, I love this guy. I wanna marry this guy. And so she checks in, how is the savings going? Do you have the $10,000 in the bank? And, and uh, he says, no, I, I don't have it. I'm still working on it. Well, how much do you have? I've got $8.32. And she said, that's close enough. <laughs> and so they went ahead and they, they got married. And the moral of the little story is interest. You know, she was really interested in marriage and you're really interested uh, in the finer things, and that's why you are here on a Thursday afternoon of Lectureship Week. I grew up in Collierville, uh, just down the road here, and uh, I remember when my mom was the secretary of the Collierville Church years ago, that uh, she was in charge of uh, getting all of the food together from the, the Carrieville Church, and she would bring it over for the lunch. Uh, Carrieville would host one of the days uh, of the luncheon, and, and that was her job. And when I was a kid, uh, I would drive my 1975 Plymouth Valiant from Collierville on, it was either Tuesday or Thursday night, I forget, but um, when I was in high school, I would drive over to the Knight Arnold building, and I would take some of those uh, classes, and I remember studying the restoration history uh, in, uh, class, and that was uh, just a great memory that, that I have. So I love MSOP, uh, but it's been a while since I've been here, but it's good to be back. I'm supposed to talk to you about four little things that are exceedingly wise, and unless you um, are familiar with the phrase or you took a peek in the book, you may have no earthly idea what are we going to be talking about today? Four little things that are exceedingly wise. And um, I, I'm gonna talk about insects. I'm gonna talk about creatures and, that are little, uh, but yet God says they are really wise. And this comes from Proverbs chapter 30, verses 24 through 28. And so if you're interested in turning over there, by all means do so, and we will spend a little time in these verses together. Isn't it interesting how that we have 1,189 chapters in this book that we affectionately refer to as the book of all books, the Bible. And in this Bible of all of those chapters, 31 of them make up that, uh, that book of Proverbs. And it is a book that is full of wisdom. I wonder, and, and since I only arrived yesterday evening, this I don't know if this was stated 
or not, but I wonder if there's not some providence involved in the designation of 31 chapter headings to give us a chapter of Proverbs to read every single day of the month for those months that have 31 days. But isn't that, isn't that interesting? And in this particular chapter, chapter 30, we're introduced to four little creatures that God calls wise, wise. So let's take a moment to do this this afternoon. Let's do an examination, just a very brief examination of each of these little creatures. And then after we do that with each one, we'll make two practical observations. And hopefully when we're finished, we can walk away not only being able to say that uh, this was not a waste of your time, uh, I, I know your time is valuable and I don't ever want to waste anybody's time, but also that we're able to, to take some observations that will enhance the way that we live our lives to the glory and honor of God. First of all, I want us to think about the ant for just a moment. Now, I didn't say the aunt, but I said the ant, okay? Uh, I don't know what your experience is with ants. Uh, I don't like them. I'm not a big fan of them, and I'm especially not a fan of them if they ever make their way into my house, because if they get into the house, they're really hard to get rid of. Uh, anybody ever experience that, have ants in your house? Okay, that's better than 50%. So, um, if this ever happens to you, I'm just going to tell you what you can do. Go get you some good toothpaste. See if you can find the hole that those ants are coming in and put some toothpaste right there. And then you won't have any ants coming into your house anymore. I'm just telling you, I did it. It worked for me. Okay? Uh, so I'm not a fan of the ants. But God says that the ants are extremely wise. So, again, not really sure if you are extremely knowledgeable about ants, but what I know is this. You've got, let's see, you've got the, the queen ant, okay, and the queen ant's job is to populate the colony, but they, they do that because of the uh, male ants whose primary objective on the planet is to interact with the queen ant in order to populate the colony. And then you have the female ants. I wonder what their job is. Well, the job of the female ants is to do all the work. I mean, that's their job. And I wonder if that's the reason that you have the words of Proverbs 6, verses 6 and following, when it says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Okay, because she was an industrious worker. You know, the, the, the thing about ants is it's not about their, their power or their might or their strength, but it's about their intellect. It's about their prowess. In fact, in our text there in Proverbs 30 and verse 25, it says that the ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Prepare their meat in the summer. So they get all of the food that they need, they bring it into their dwelling, and it provides not only their sustenance, but it also provides warmth because those ants, the, the colony of ants, are surrounded by all of that food and it just keeps them warm. So the text says that they're not strong. Now, it, the strength is not in their physical ability, but it's in their intellect. But it's not to say that they have no strength whatsoever. Have you ever seen that uh, movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the old Disney movie? Some of you have seen that? Do you remember, uh, uh, what, what, what's the scientist's name? Do you remember his name? I can't remember. What is it? Rick Moranis was the actor. Okay, Rick Moranis was the actor. I, I forget the, the name that, that he had as the actor in the movie. But uh, he developed this machine, and he was able to shrink things, which was pretty cool. Uh, well, his two teenage kids, along with the two teenage neighbor boys, came over, and they were right in the, uh, uh, the, the lens, if you will, of this uh, shrinking device, this shrinking gun, and they are shrunk. 
and Rick Moranis' character comes up to the, uh, to the attic where this device is at, and, and he's just so upset that he's made another invention that doesn't work. So he thinks. And so he starts to beat this thing, and, and pieces of it are flying out all over the place, and um, he's made a mess. So he gets the broom, and he gets the dustpan, and he starts to, sw to sweep all of these pieces up into the dustpan. And unbeknownst to him, his two kids and the neighbor kids have been shrunk, and he's now sweeping them up into the dustpan as well. And he puts all of this trash and the kids into the trash bag, and he takes them out, into, out to the trash. And um, the kids get out of the trash, and they look, and lo and behold, it looks like it will take them forever to make their way through the yard back to the house. Well, they're going through the yard, and as they're going through the yard, they start to come into contact with all of these weird things, and one of them is an ant. And the scientist's little boy was also somewhat of an intellect, and uh, he said, you know, we can use this ant because of the ant's strength. We can use this ant to carry us back to the house. The neighbor little boy said, we cannot. It's, a, it's an ant. It doesn't have any strength. And he said, an ant can, can lift 20 times its weight, something like that. I don't remember exactly, but it was a lot. And the little boy said, that's like bench pressing a bulldozer. <laughs> you remember that? So an ant has some ability to lift, but it, it's not about that strength. It's about its, its mind. It's said that the ant is the, um, the most intelligent of all insects, perhaps only second, to the honeybee. And I kind of like that. My granddad, uh, we, uh, he died just recently, but he was uh, an electrician by trade, but uh, he was also a beekeeper. And he was known in the area of Boot Hill of Missouri, he was known as a beekeeper. Uh, and so they're super intelligent as well. Isn't it interesting how that God uses these little creatures right? He uses these little creatures and hones in on something about them, in this case their intellect, to talk to us about wisdom. You know, I find it of, of interest that God is not seeking to make us supers. If you have any interest in comic books and Marvel kind of things and, and stuff like that, you, you hear terminology about people that have some spe special, we'll call it a gift, they have some special gift. Maybe it's the, the, the gift to, um, uh, to, to know what somebody's thinking. Maybe it's a gift to fly. Maybe it's a gift of speed or something like that. And in the comics, they'll be referred to as supers. Well, God is not making us supers. But yet he gives us intellect and he gives us this ability, this prowess, if you will, to be able to do some pretty super things. It was mentioned in the, the introduction. It's always a little bit embarrassing. He handed me that. I don't even remember what I turned into you. But it's always a little embarrassing when someone stands up and reads your pedigree. I, you know, what, it's just, let's just get up there and go. Let's get up there and preach. But it was mentioned that I'm a pilot. And I've been flying for... Uh, over 15 years, I don't remember exactly how many now, but uh, it's been over 15 years. And I fly um, at 14,999 14, feet and below, okay? That's, that's the altitude, the max altitude that I will fly. Uh, now, the plane that I have, um, the, uh, the service ceiling on it, I believe, is 14,000 feet, Okay. Now, I said I'll fly 14,900, uh, sorry, 17,999 feet. 18,000 feet gets you into what's called class alpha airspace, and that's where your commercial jets fly, okay? I will fly generally below 12,500 because um, I don't want to get hypoxia uh, and uh, not be able to think clearly. But isn't it amazing how you can get into this machine with a motor on it and these wings, give it some power, and you can fly a few thousand feet in the air. 
Isn't that cool? In just a, a little while, I'm going to go over to the Memphis airport. I'm going to, going to get on a Delta jet, and we're going to fly about 28,000 feet at just over 300 knots toward Atlanta, and I'll get on another plane and, and head to, to Virginia. How did we do that? Because of our mind. We were able to put that together. Now, God gave us that ability, of course. Isn't it interesting how that you can pick up um, a phone and you can call someone over in a, another part of the globe and talk to them instantaneously? I'm going to Israel in a couple of months, and uh, I'm going to preach at uh, the, the church in Nazareth. And I'm so excited about that. Uh, being able to preach there. Uh, and I was talking with the preacher's son by phone the other day. We have that ability because of our, our intellect, right? And so it's not about our, our being super as in something beyond the, the natural, but it's about God giving us these abilities to do some pretty super or incredible things things. Let's make a couple of observations about the ant. The first one is this. I think from the ant we learned something about the, this matter of stewardship. Okay, Again, as we were looking at Proverbs chapter 6 there just briefly, God uses the female ant to hone in to discuss this matter of not being, um, of not being lazy, of being good stewards. Now stewardship is a biblical and vital subject. Did you know that there's more said in the Bible about the subject of stewardship than there is about heaven and hell and baptism combined? There is. And yet we don't spend as much time talking about the matter of stewardship. When I think about stewardship, I suppose what comes into my mind immediately is, uh, is financial stewardship. I don't know what your thoughts are about this, but I think it's wise to put aside a little bit of money for a rainy day. I think that's wise. Uh, I remember uh, several years ago, I called my wife and said, let's have a Chick-fil-A date. Now, I had an ulterior motive here, um, and it was this. We're going to sit at Chick-fil-A, and I had brought some documents for us, and uh, we're going to do some budgeting. Now, we, you know, newlyweds, and uh, we, uh, you know, we were kind of just getting by and not really budgeting. And, and uh, I decided I don't, I don't want us to, to live that way. I want us to, to have a budget. I've been doing a lot of listening to Dave Ramsey. And, uh, you know, every dollar has to have a name. And so we sat down together and uh, we budgeted. And we have been doing the envelope system for years. And uh, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, now, I hate to go to Kroger and I hate to go to Walmart with my wife because she takes her uh, coupon book. That's her envelope system. She takes the coupon book and it's got all these sections in it. And she will scan items and then she'll pay for them out of this envelope. And then she'll do it again and then pay for these items out of this envelope. And it drives me nuts. Uh, but, man, it helps us from a budgeting standpoint, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, but this idea of stewardship, money. I, I, think, it's, I think it's good to, to save for a rainy day, and I think it's good to put away money for retirement. Did you know in 3 John, verses 1 and 2, when, when John is talking about his uh, beloved Gaius or Gaius, depending on which school you go to. We'll go with Gaius. Uh, but he says this, he says, that I pray for you, Gaius, that you will do two things, that you'll be well and that you'll prosper. You remember that? That you'll, that you'll be well. What is that talking about? Well, that you'll be healthy and that you'll prosper. What's that talking about? Financially, that you'll prosper, okay? Did you know that you can't pray that uh, about everybody? You can't pray for everybody to prosper. Why is it? Because not everybody's a good steward with their resources. But Gaius apparently was. And, and we should be good stewards with our resources. But it's not just about financial things that we should be good stewards with. We should also be good stewards with our time and with our abilities. So let's see. We've got time. We've got abilities. We've got 
dollars? Did you know that God only wants us to give a tad time, ability, and dollars? And so think about your time. We spend so much of our time um, doing things that uh, take away from what's most important. Now, I, I suspect it's not the case that anybody in this room does this all the time, right? I, I'm Surely that's not the case. Did you know that the average amount of time that a high school student spends on a screen is about eight hours a day? That does not include the amount of time that they're spending in front of a screen at school for required things in the classroom. What does that say? It says they get up early and they get on the device. When they have a break at school, they're on their device. Or if they're not having a break, they're just sneaking and looking. Or when they, and when they get home from school, they're back on a device and they're staying up late on their device. It was mentioned earlier, I'm a licensed professional counselor and occasion I will meet with students of that uh, population. And uh, one of the questions I'll ask them is, can you tell me about your sleep? Uh, tell me when you go to sleep. Tell me when you get up in the morning. Well, I don't sleep much. Okay, you don't sleep much. You're not resting. Tell me why. Well, I, you know, my phone's right there, and, and uh, I, I get on that phone at night, and sometimes I'll wake up in the night, and, and I'll check and see who texted me or what instant message I got or whatever, and, and they're on their phone, their device. And, and so hours and hours a day spent doing things that are just irrelevant, really. So we waste so much time on things that are not important. And then our abilities. We should be good stewards with our abilities. Think about it this way. You know, God expects us to use our time, abilities, and dollars to honor and glorify him. What abilities do you have? Can you put your finger on the pulse of who you are and ask yourself, what ability do I have? What am I good at that I can use to the glory of God? Maybe up until this point, it's, you know, I've been good at this or at that, but it's all been about maybe making an extra dollar. It's all been about whatever makes me happy, whatever brings me joy. Or maybe it's all about how can I get out of the house and, and just have some me time. To... I get it. All those things are, have value to them. But maybe a better question is, how can I use something that I'm really good at, this talent, to honor and glorify God? You see, that's something that we learn from the ant. Another thing we learn from the ant is the reality that God will provide. God will provide. When I think of the, um, you know, the provisions that God has given to us, one of the passages that immediately comes to mind is uh, Ephesians chapter 2. You remember in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 where it says um, that uh, we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his, what? workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The word workmanship means masterpiece. You know that. If we are the masterpiece of God, doesn't it just make sense that God is going to provide for us? That he's not going to withhold anything from us that we need and even not a lot of the things that we want, but he's really going to provide. He's going to take care of us. Look at Matthew chapter 6 with me for, for just a moment. Matthew chapter 6. In about verse 24, Jesus is preaching this incredible um, sermon. And he says in verse number 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and he'll love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. The American Standard Version says, be not anxious. In the Greek, it's, it's, it's oligopistoi, uh, which means uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to be anxious, to take no thought of. And then it says um, in verse number 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit of his stature? Why take ye thought for raiment? Drop down to verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? And then verse 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. He's talking about this idea of don't be anxious, don't have a, a, a puny and weak and insignificant faith. 
Now, I understand that this is a passage that some folks really struggle with who are dealing with um, mental health challenges. It makes sense, doesn't it? You know, uh, someone comes to me who's a Christian and they say, uh, Neil, I've got anxiety. Or, Neil, I have depression. Approximately 10% of the country um, presents with some mental health disorder. And I've worked with Christians from nearly 40 churches of Christ in the state of Georgia. You may think, I, I didn't even know we had that many. Uh, we, we got a lot. My practice is in Georgia. I live in Virginia, and I teach for Freed Hardeman in Tennessee. I pay taxes in three states. Uh, but I see a lot of people in uh, Georgia. And just in the Atlanta area itself, I've worked with over 30 churches. And so someone comes to me and says, Neil, I, I've got anxiety. They're a Christian. I'm dealing with anxiety. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's work through that a little bit. What is, what is causing some of that anxiety? And, and we're able to deal with that, and they're, they get better by and by. And, and, uh, but you know what? What Jesus is talking about here is not a mental health disorder. Jesus is talking about individuals who may be on the front end, who later present as having a mental health disorder, but on the front end, they put so much faith and confidence in themselves or maybe in other people, and they fail to put enough confidence and trust in God. Uh, there is a, uh, a psychiatrist, he's deceased now, but his name is Dr. William Glasser, a famous psychiatrist who worked with a theory called choice theory and then developed reality therapy based on the choice theory. And uh, the whole idea behind the choice theory is this. We, we have a choice in everything. Everything. Everything that we think, everything that we do, it is our choice. And if we are experiencing anxiety or if we're experiencing depression, or if we're experiencing some mental health-related challenge, it ultimately goes back to a choice. In fact, he didn't even say that you have anxiety or you have depression. He would have said, you are anxieting. You are depressing. Uh, he said that the only mental health disorder is a result of um, a significant physical brain trauma or maybe someone who was born with a significant uh, neurological uh, related issue. Now, I could get into a whole debate into that situation, but I simply wanted to make this point. And that is, there is much to be said about the anxiety coming into our life as a result of some of the choices that we, we make in our thinking and in our doing. That's why the Proverbs writer said, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Um, but if we can give some thought and attention to this idea of the provisions of God, then I think that can help us. All right, number next. Think about the coney mentioned in this text. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 26, the coney. Um, the Bible says the conies are but a feeble folk, yet make their houses in the rocks. The coney is sometimes referred to as a rock badger. Sometimes it's referred to as a rabbit. I don't know a whole lot about them. I don't even know if the image I put up on the screen is what a coney actually looks like. It's just about the best I, I could find. But what I know about the coney is, is that they, they were not able to hide from their prey by digging in the earth. And so what they would do is they would hide in the rocks of Palestine, okay, to stay out of the way of their, of, of their prey or, or of uh, those that would prey on them. And so that being the case, um, they were deemed as not being clean animals, according to Leviticus chapter 11. So what do we learn from the coney? I think the first one is this, weakness does not equal failure. You look at the coney and it being small and having uh, no great ability to, to fend for itself, protect itself, other than just hiding in the rocks, you think about it as being weak. 
And yet God chose this little so-called weak creature to teach us some pretty valuable lessons about being wise. And the first one is be wise enough to realize that weakness does not mean failure. I want you to look with me in another passage, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite chapters. And it says in verse number 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What that verse tells me is, is that on occasion we are going to be faced with calamity. We're going to be faced with suffering in our life, and that through no fault of our own. Look at verse number 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Another word there is frailty. Not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Sometimes we're going to suffer because of uh, just natural things about our environment. We just had a series of storms, I think, that came through this area. Out west, we've had some significant storms uh, as well. I think we've got some more storms that are coming through the area uh, on Friday. But sometimes, because of the frailty of life, we're going to suffer. You look at uh, verse 21, "...because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God." Disease. Sometimes we're going to face disease. Look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain uh, together until now. Uh, groaneth, to moan together with. It's the idea that someone has hurt us. Okay? So we might look at these passages and say, well, okay, <laughs> because we're human beings, we're weak. Well, just because we may be weak, it doesn't mean that we are failures. In fact, you go a little bit further in this text. Look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That tells us about our ability to endure. And then it says in verse number 31, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us. I wrote in the margin of my Bible there, if God be for us, who can be against us and who cares? As long as God is for us, that's good enough. And then we come to verse number 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, and persecution, and famine, nakedness, peril, and sword? And then it says in verse 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Again, back to that idea of endurance. The point is, from the coney, this seemingly weak creature, teaches us something about this idea that weakness does not have to equal failure. There's some wisdom there. And there's not a single person in this room that's a failure before God. And then you think about the idea that frailty is overcome with the strength of Jesus. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 11, what is Jesus? Jesus is the stone or the rock that was made, head, uh, made the head of the corner, right? All kinds of folks are looking for uh, different ways to get uh, to heaven, now, they say that it's about the one way. It's about, about Jesus, but in reality, it's, it's really not. It's about the different paths that make sense to them in order to get to heaven. But the truth is, there's only one way to heaven, and that way is Jesus. I heard it said before that uh, you may know something about botany, but if you don't know Jesus, then you don't know the lily of the valley and Sharon's sweetest rose. I've heard it said that, um, uh, you know, you may know something about archaeology, but if you don't know Jesus, you don't know the Rock of Ages. And these little coney creatures, they, they knew something about hiding in the rocks for protection. And if we want protection, then we've got to hide in the Rock of Jesus. And then you've got the locust. The locust. It sounds like another uh, creature that I probably would not be too fond of. I haven't had any experiences with locusts as I have with ants, but uh, don't really want to. But we learned something about them too in Scripture. Uh, in fact, the locusts were a rather unique um, insect. 
If you look in Exodus chapter 10, you are introduced to the locusts, and they were the eighth plague that God used to try to uh, get his people released from Egyptian bondage so that they could make their way to the promised land. I think about uh, Matthew chapter 3 and Mark chapter 1 when uh, John the Immerser was in the wilderness. He would eat the locusts for sustenance. And so God used the locust for provision in uh, several ways in Scripture. Very interesting creature. In Proverbs 30 and verse 27, it says, The locusts have no king, yet go they forth, all of them, by bands. By bands. What can we learn from these little uh, creatures that have the ability to create such chaos? Well, it's interesting to note that before the locusts can come together and create such chaos, they are actually loners. Did you know that? That locusts actually would prefer just to be by themselves, just to be a loner. But it's not until the conditions are right that they need to come together as an army, if you will, to, to do their job, to do their, their work. Well, we're a little bit like that. I think about the fact that from the locust we learn that growth requires the right conditions. It requires the right conditions. The locusts won't c come together and swarm and do their uh, tasks until the conditions are right. Did you know that the church of our Lord will not really grow, that the local church will not really grow until the conditions are right? How many times have... have uh, uh, you known, uh, maybe this has happened in the congregation where you are, you've known elders or maybe uh, the men, if, if it's just uh, men groups uh, leading the congregation because there are no elders. But how many congregations you know that have uh, invited folks to come in, maybe because they've, they've written a good book or an article or, or whatever, and they said, this is what you've got to do in order to grow the church. And a lot of their ideas are good. But how many times has it happened where someone like that is invited in to deliver a great series of lessons on how to grow the church and they leave and the church just remains stagnant? It happens over and over again. Well, let me show you something in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 14. I think this is actually on the banner in the auditorium. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now here's where I really want us to, zone, to zero in. From whom the whole body fitly joined together. And compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body. Now, if you like to mark in your Bible, I would underscore that. Increase of the body. Unto the edifying of itself in love. You want to increase the body? You want to grow the local church? The conditions have to be right. That's something that we learn from the locusts. Well, what are those conditions? Well, first of all, it has to be a church that loves. That's that last phrase there, of itself in love. A lot of times what we have in congregations is we have pockets uh, within the churches. Uh, maybe another way of saying that is cliques. But you have cliques in the church, and, and they get along. But you know what? This side of the congregation doesn't even know this side of the congregation. And this little pocket group over here doesn't associate with this little pocket group over here. You know what I'm talking about. And when those types of things exist, it's no wonder that the church won't grow. And then second of all, if you back up in verse 16, unto the edifying. So love and edification. You want the church to go, grow, you've got to have love. You want the church to grow, you've got to have edification. You want the church to grow, you've got to do it together. It's not about the preacher doing his thing. It's not about the elders doing their thing, the deacons doing their thing, or uh, this uh, group doing its thing, or this program doing its thing, but it's about the whole church working together 
to do the thing for Jesus. And then a, a second lesson is this. Independence does not mean go it alone. The locusts were very independent creatures. They would just assume to be loners, but God didn't design us that way. In fact, when you look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18, it is not good that man should be alone. In Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Listen to that. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, as the dew of Vermont and as the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion, for it was there that God commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And if I understand my Bible, if I'm going to enjoy the there and then, I've got to right now in the here and now be united together in fellowship with my brethren. It's got to happen here if it's ever going to happen there. And that's the way that God designed it. In John 17, verses 20 and 21, the Bible tells us that neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so if the world's going to come to Jesus, it's going to begin because we are one. You know, before we can, before we can, can do great things for God, before we can be those soldiers in the army, of God. 2 Timothy 2 verses 3 and 4. We've got to come together as a people that really love one another. And then last, you've got the spiders. The spiders. Um, Proverbs chapter 30 verse 28. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Now your translation uh, may not use the word spider. It may use the word lizard. And if you use the English Standard Version, I'm pretty sure that translation uses the word lizard. And there's a good reason for that. In the Revised Version, it's not uh, the word spider, but it's the word lizard. Uh, it's not the same Hebrew word for spider as is used in other places in the Old Testament uh, when it talks about the spider spinning its web. So there are a couple of thoughts on that. One is that... Um, it, in Proverbs 30, it actually is talking about a lizard. Uh, another thought is that it is one of 700 species of spiders in Palestine. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know which it is, but we'll, we'll just go with spiders. It really doesn't matter for the, the purpose of our study, but um, we'll just say that it is, in fact, a, a spider. But what does a spider do? According to this text, a spider has, uh, has the ability to... Uh, to go up, you just kind of picture this, has the ability to go up and hide itself in the rafters of the king's palaces. It doesn't matter whether you're poor or rich or somewhere in between. You can have spiders in your house. And um, my, my daughter, uh, we took our son to Fried Hardeman to, uh, to start school three years ago. He's a junior now. But um, we went into his dorm room. And this was her first experience with the dorm room at Freed Hardeman. And uh, there was a, an insect in there. I don't remember the kind at the time. It may have been a spider. Um, but she saw that insect, and she said, I'm not going to Freed Hardeman. And I, I said, all, because of, all because of a little insect? I said, honey, you've got insects in your house too. So, well, that's different. No, not really. We, you see, we're, we all can have insects in our house. We have spiders in our house, whether we're rich or poor. And this text tells us that you've got those spiders up there in the king's palace. Well, what can we learn from the little spider? I think number one is God can take the small and make them great. God can take, have you ever seen Charlotte's Web? That's a pretty cool uh, movie for, for kids, and that spider can do some pretty fascinating things in that web. Small creature, but yet very great. How many people among us are trying to be great in some ways that are just, well, sad, for a lack of a better way of putting it? We've got that, the, the terminology now, I want to be an influencer. How many followers can I get on social media? How many likes can I get? How many shares? You know, they want to be on YouTube and they want to be the next big influencer and they want to make their million or multi-millions by being an influencer in social media. You know, God is not looking for um, 
for people that he can make great in the eyes of the world, but he's looking for ordinary people like you and me who would be willing to be faithful to him so that he can make them great. That's what he's looking for. And then I think a final point is to please God, you got to have faith. You have to have faith. I don't know that a spider has ever been interviewed. And if a spider has been interviewed, interviewed, I'm quite certain that the spider remained silent in the interview. Uh, but you reckon that if a spider was interviewed, that it would say, you know, I climb up into that king's palace and I'm just convinced that, uh, you know, because of my great faith in God, I'm going to be able to hold on to, to that rafter. You think a spider thinks about that well you know you and I we should be thinking about that we are who we are we're able to do what we can do because of faith in God you know I think about Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 without faith it's impossible to please God four little things that were great I hope that we can take something that we've learned from this that will maybe challenge us a little bit but it will make us more wise in the process. Thank you.